Now on BBC One, as the blockbuster sci-fi trilogy directed by George Lucas returns to thrill a new generation of cinema goers, Omnibus tells the story of the most arty of filmmakers who decided to reach for the stars. slightly discomforted by eventually some point I'm going to have to see 20-year-old acting. I mean, there's the odd sideburn here and there, but for the most part, like any fairy tale, it's timeless. Star Wars, conceived and directed by George Lucas, was originally released in 1977 and went on to become the highest grossing movie of its time. And I was just making a movie that I thought was going to be an enjoyable movie that I wanted to make that was tell a story that I wanted to tell in a way that I wanted to tell it. Most of the cast go around saying we all thought it was a bit of a turkey when we made it. I had great confidence that we were going to make all three. I remember predicting this thing's going to be bigger than Planet of the Apes. I didn't think the movie was going to sell at all. Now we zoom ahead to, to last week where we call up George and say, so, George, the picture's opening. What do you think he'll do? And he said, Well, um, he said, he said we, have a, we have a pool, the, the board of directors and I. And he said, I, I, I forecast it's going to do about $9.3 million. For the so weekend. I said, George, how'd you come up with 9.3? And he said, Well, that's what a movie did last week, and it was a movie just opening. And he said, I figure if, you know, this is a re release, it's 20 years old, it can't do better than 9.3. So, um, you know, we called him back after the film made $35 million the opening weekend. But I think secretly George knew. With the release of the special edition, Star Wars is again the largest grossing movie. Lucas used the power and profits from Star Wars to establish himself as an independent producer operating from Skywalker Ranch in Northern California. The world of cinema, especially in terms of you know critics and studio executives, which are the two judges, um, is very uh, that that world is very bigoted. They have a very narrow picture about what a film can be, and they have a very um, strong opinion about what shouldn't get made and what isn't acceptable. George came to Hollywood and with sort of a bookkeeper's mentality and said, you know, this is sort of shifty the way they work Hollywood and they steal all the profits and, you know, what if I raise my own money and what do I need them for? And he went north and uh, spent his own money on all his movies and sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. You know, George is like a great builder. He's, a, you know, and once he has it in his mind that he's going to, you know, make these six Star Wars and, and uh, you know, untold billions of dollars, and this, nothing's going to stop him. I've been waiting for you, Obi-Wan. We meet again at last. This notion of self-belief was echoed in the central philosophy of Star Wars. The Force? Now, the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. I thought the beauty of it was that you were able to interpret what it means to you. So if people want to take religious aspects of it and run with that, 
Other people say it's like sort of an inward spirit, um, an energy that surrounds and binds us. It's just ambiguous enough that you're able to make of it what you will. For me, the force is the power that everyone has that they usually don't use. Yoda, in my film, says something interesting. Always with you, what cannot be done. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. The Force for Lucas is a personal philosophy born out of near tragedy. On the 12th of June, 1962, Lucas, then aged 18, was driving home from the library when the car he was driving was involved in a serious collision. Before that, I just went with what I felt was the right thing and what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed. And so for the first time, I think I sat down during that summer and did a lot of meditating on my future and what I, what I was here for. It had a lot to do with his philosophy in life afterwards, you know. Uh, he's had his chance, you know, it almost ended, and so now he wanted to make something of it. And after that's when you heard George start saying something like, uh, if you want to do it, do it. I remember him being born as he was on Mother's Day on May 14th in 1944. And uh, he was um, uh, just a, you know, scrawny little guy with uh, sort of big ears flapping and so forth. And we, and of course he was our, the only boy in the family, so he was really sort of the, the uh, apple of everybody's eye. I was always interested in, in building things, so I had a little shed out back where a lot of tools and I would build chess sets and doll houses and uh, cars. We built lot, lots and lots of race cars. Uh, you know, we push around and, and run down hills and things you know, like soapbox derby. Lucas's father, George Walton Lucas Sr., was a self-made man who owned the local stationery store and was a committed Methodist. Uh, George's dad was <laughs> very strict. Uh, and, um, you know, he used to make George <laughs> shave his head every summer. Us, it didn't bother George. I mean, he was humiliated. I guess I had the advantage of always feeling that my father was very fair. Uh, he may have been very strict, but he was also very fair. He also told me what, why I couldn't do whatever it was. It wasn't just sort of edicts that were laid down arbitrarily. It was always a, a reason behind everything. And as I got older, uh, I was very interested in cars from the point of about 12, 11 or 12. Got extremely interested in cars and motorcycles. In high school, we started playing with real cars now, which was a lot of fun. And, and only, you know, neither George nor I had the kind of cars that everyone else had. My father got me a little, a little tiny Fiat, the smallest, you know, a little two-stroke engine in it and stuff, and he figured that would be safe because it couldn't go that fast. And I immediately, I worked in a foreign car service, so I immediately took it in and took the engine apart, put it back together again, and made it extremely fast. Academically, he was uh, not the greatest student in the world. His grades were not really very good. And I think it was just that he, he was not interested in the things that they were teaching. I had a, a strong interest, even in high school, of going to art school to become an illustrator, but my father was very much against it. Uh, said I could do it if I wanted to, but he wasn't going to pay for it or anything. So I could do it on my own. And knowing that I was per basically a lazy person, he knew I wasn't going to go out and get my own job and pay for my own tuition and all that stuff. So I um, got interested in photography after my accident and um, heard about film school, and I didn't really know anything about it. I hadn't gone to the movies that often. But I thought it was connected with the photography, and it was sort of closest thing I could get to to an art school. So we wanted a school that didn't have a lot of requirements on math or anything else, but would let us go into more of the, the creative side. In those days, film school wasn't like it is now. It, film school was, uh, nobody knew about it, and uh, 
they sort of stood outside the door at film school and grabbed you as you walked by and asked if you wanted to be a film major. But when we went to film school, the idea that anyone would ever work in the movie industry was unheard of. It never happened, and the teachers would look at you like you were pathetic when you'd ask about a job. If you go to USC and go to film school, you're just going to become a ticket taker at Disneyland. You're never going to get a real job. At USC, Lucas opted to study English and astronomy, as well as his two film classes. One was a history of film, and the other was uh, an animation class. And my animation class was the only production class I had. And they gave me a minute's worth of film to play with on the animation camera to learn how it worked. And I made a movie out of it. The instructor was so impressed with it, he entered it in a bunch of film festivals, and it, I think it won about, I don't know, 18 or 19 film festivals that year. Everything I did was, was revolved around film, and that's why I lived 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I couldn't think of anything else. He always had something special. We noticed it, I noticed it, others noticed it at the time. George was very shy, but he, he was very energetic, and he, he was sort of a loner in a way. George was seen at the time, at film school, after the first or second semester. Um, he was recognized as being the, the star. The culmination of Lucas's achievements at film school was his triumph in the National Student Film Festival for Best Drama with the futuristic THX 1138 electronic labyrinth. Resources at USC were scarce, but Lucas was able to obtain funds designated for a military class he had volunteered to teach. The Navy crew had all the greatest equipment, had all the free film, color film. A lot of us had to shoot black and white at the time. So it was very shrewd of him to make THX with the Navy crew. I remember when I saw the first cut that he had done of, of THX 1138 as a student film, there was this wild um, mixture of Bach, and then skittering around in that were these uh, the chatterings of almost indistinguishable voices uh, in air traffic control or something like that. It was really uh, quite unusual and very cinematic. And it was full of uh, technical goo and uh, it was fun. The one route from film school to Hollywood was a scholarship to Warner Brothers. Lucas won and found himself on the set of the only film currently in production, a musical called Finian's Rainbow, directed by the one film school graduate to penetrate the studio system. I noticed this skinny kid watching me. So I just, you know, was curious who this, you know, young man was. And I think I went over to him and said, you know, hi, you know, uh, see anything interesting? And he said, no, not much. He sort of took me under his wing and said, you're going to have to learn to write if you're ever going to learn to direct. You know, and, and you'll never get a chance to direct unless you can write. I said, but I'm not a writer. I hate writing and I can't do this. And he says, look, I'll, I'll help you. After Finian's Rainbow, I was making The Rain People, and George was there helping, but he was also writing uh, the THX movie. The way it worked out is Francis made this deal for me to write the script of THX. So I was paid as a write screenwriter on THX, and I'd write from 4 in the morning until 6 in the morning, and then I'd work on the film all day. And then, in order to keep myself interested, uh, besides all the other things I had to do, I wanted to shoot a documentary. After The Rain People, Coppola and Lucas decided to make the feature-length version of the student film THX outside of the Hollywood system. Full of 60s radicalism, they moved north to San Francisco and established American Zoetrope. If you're going to San Francisco... It wasn't an anti-Hollywood statement by any means. 
It was independence, that we could have our own company independent of um, the majors. We wanted to own our own studio and make it run the way we thought it should run. Coppola negotiated a seven-picture deal with Warners. Unfortunately, the first film he made was George's film, THX. George and I had collaborated together on writing the screenplay, and uh, it fulfilled all of our fantasies about the kind of films we wanted to make. Walter Merchant and I always like to call the film a cubist film because what we tried to do is to attach the images in terms of the stories and the themes and the sound and the images were all slightly different views of the same thing seen simultaneously. Wait. No. He no. had, uh, it looked like hundreds of people from San Francisco cutting all their hair off to be totally bald. How he ever got them to do it, I don't know, but he did. I have to, he's a G34. But the most impressive thing about it was the set, which was sort of an endless white set. Francis gave a big speech in front of the Warner Brothers brass and said, this is the first film American Zotrope has made. I let George go on his own and, and finish his, his own creative vi vision. And we have seven other films we're going to make this year. And here it is. And he showed them the film, and they hated it. They hated THX, and they wanted to recut it. They didn't know what they had, and they didn't hated all the scripts. And they pulled the rug out from under Zoetrope and said, now you have to pay us back for all this money we gave you, because we don't like any of this stuff. We don't want to have anything to do with it. And so that's really where, you know, suddenly Francis owed Warner Brothers about half a million dollars, uh, which we didn't have. And um, that forced Francis to take a job uh, which ended up being the godfather. I just, after THX, told him that, you know, to try to write something that really had emotion. And I said, why don't you try to write something out of your own life that, that you know, has warmth and, and humor and uh, that people can relate to, so that he, he began to write American Graffiti. <laughs> Growing up in the United States in that period of time, the car was everything, especially for a boy. You know, you're, especially in high school, you're defined by your car and what kind of car you're driving, how well you're able to handle your car and all that sort of thing. Mike Atkins, I've been cruising Modesto since the early 60s. Hi, I'm Dave Turnbow. Where was I in 62? I was cruising Modesto. I'm Robert Ross, and I graduated from Thomas Downey High School in 1962 with George Lucas, and I cruised Modesto. I love and protect this car until death do us part. This is a super fine machine. This might even be better than Daryl Starbird's Super Flex Moon. It is. It's better than Daryl Starbird's Super Flex Moonbird. The characters oh, yeah. in graffiti were really composites of people we knew and and people or who we were or we who we thought we were. And, um... Like Rick Dreyfus is a little bit like Willard. Terry the Toad is a little bit like George. There's so much of George and Terry the Toad, it's unbelievable. Uh, the botching of events, um, you know, in, in terms of his life, uh, his social ineptness yeah, in terms yeah, of dealing with girls early on his career, I mean, that's, uh, that's very much George. You know, I really love the Philly Tuck and Roll upholstery. You do? Yeah. Well, you know, come in, I'll let you feel it. I mean, you know, you can touch it if you want. Um, I'll let you feel the upholstery. Okay. The, the really novel thing about American Graffiti was turning it into a kind of a rock musical uh, in which every scene has a musical background. I wrote the scenes to the, to the music so I knew exactly what song was going to go where and how it was going to fit together. The failure of THX and the potential cost of music copyright meant that Lucas had difficulty finding a studio to make graffiti. Eventually, Universal agreed to finance it as a low-budget picture. The one thing I remember most clearly is almost getting fired for taking two donuts when it was well understood that the limit was one per cast member. And the budget was so tight. We didn't even have a camera car. 
the, the car that I was riding in with Cindy Williams was being towed by another car, which had the trunk removed so that the camera and the sound man and the director could all sit in the trunk of this car. And every time I looked at George, he was asleep. He shot everything with two cameras in such a way that you never knew whether you were on screen or not, whether the camera was photographing you or not. So you gave 100% uh, every time you ran through the scene. I'd stage a scene and put the cameras way off on the side and let the, the action sort of live unto itself without playing to the camera. He said, um, I'm not really getting a chance to direct this film now. I don't have time. So I kind of thought, well, <laughs> he said, I'm really going to direct it in the editing room. So I'm just gathering a lot of footage here, and then I'm, you know, that's where I'm going to make all my choices. So I would just shoot everything I could possibly shoot, and then I would go back and figure out how I was going to put it together later. And George is really still a documentary filmmaker, which is more like his personality, where he sort of stands back and catches little things, you know, like an observer. That style is, I mean, it made American Graffiti look like a documentary, and there are parts of Star Wars which are amazing because it looks like a documentary. I enjoy the cinema verite where you're on the move, trying to catch real life, you know, trying to have eyes in the back of your head, trying to, you know, agonizing at the end of the day over the missed moments. I like this. The, the, the naturalistic look. That's one of the things about Star Wars. Things aren't perfect. Things aren't perfectly framed. You purposely frame things slightly off in order to give you that sense that you sort of caught something. I finished the film, and we screened the film for the studio uh, up here in San Francisco. And the executives came up, and they saw the film, and um, the audience loved the film. We came out of the back of the theater, and this studio executive said, Well, I'm very disappointed, and I, we have a lot of work to do, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, are you crazy? I said, we just showed this movie, and, and uh, the audience loved it. I said, you ought to go get on your knees and thank this young guy for saving your job, I told him. And if you don't want I said, we'll be happy to buy the film. Lucas was not involved in the recut ordered by the studio. Graffiti became the most profitable movie in history, taking $50 for every dollar invested and making Lucas a millionaire. And eventually, after Star Wars came out, I was able to go back and restore the films the way I wanted them. So now, in terms of being on video, they're the way they were originally intended. And the original mutilated version doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> For his next project, Lucas turned to an idea he'd been working on in the early days of Zoetrope, for a film based on the Vietnam War. Lucas, a diabetic, had avoided the draft, but was intrigued by the situation. However, the studios refused to back the project that would eventually become Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. I was interested in the human side of the war and the fact that here was a great nation that had all this technology and was losing a war to uh, basically tribesmen. So he took that situation in a nutshell and transposed it not only out of Vietnam but into a galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. I knew I wanted to take a kind of serial motif very fast-paced action idea, and then tie these these themes to it. A rocket ship is loaded with enough solarite to destroy the principal cities of the Earth. George wanted to do Flash Gordon, and he met with the people who owned it, and they didn't take him at all seriously. He took the idea of the Flash Gordon trailers, and, you know, the, the diagonal titles that talk about the universe at that point, and then he sort of combined it with a Stanley Kubrick 2001 world, you know, and then created his own Flash Gordon. Lucas set to the torturous process of writing Star Wars. A successful director now, he was courted by the major studios to make various pictures, but resisted. Graffiti had removed the need to take a job. He'd fly down and he had a little briefcase, and in the briefcase was a pair of underpants and a, and a deodorant and his notebook. And he'd take out his notebook and 
close it. And, and you say, well, George, this isn't working, or that character makes notes. He'd go, OK, right. You know, and he'd take his notes, and he'd go and visit all his friends. Then he'd fly back home and rewrite it some more. We had a whole, hard, a whole Star Wars script that I thought was fine. And uh, then he chucked it. And I think he had seen Hidden Fortress by that point and was interested in the two servants. When I started Star Wars, the part of Hidden Fortress that I was inspired by was ultimately the fact that the story's point of view is told from the lowest level person in the film. In, in that film, it's the two peasants. He started again with these two robots lost in the wilderness and sort of used this little preamble to get back to the story. What mission? What are you talking about? After 15 months, Lucas had produced a 13-page treatment, but it was rejected by the studios. Unable to produce a coherent script, he commissioned NASA artist Ralph McQuarrie to illustrate his ideas, and these drawings won the confidence of Fox executive Alan Ladd, Jr. I don't understand this movie, but I trust you, and I think you're a talented guy. And I'm investing in you, I'm not investing in this script. And for him to do that, and then defend the script, to the board and to his superiors and stuff was a very brave thing to do uh, because I don't think he ever understood it until he finally saw it. He would call and he'd say, I'm not sure I, I'm going to make the deal. And, and I'd say, why? And he'd say, well, they're not giving me control. They're not giving me the rights to the sequels. And I'd pause and I'd say, George, you're lucky to get $10 million to make this movie. And you know, uh, let's just make the first one, and, and he said, no, no, I really, you know, it's going to be better if I can control number two and three. I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. The who? I'm here to rescue you. I've got your... For Star Wars, Lucas wanted a cast of unknowns and announced that no one from graffiti would be used. He began open casting sessions and was able to fill two of his three principal roles. Coincidental to the beginning of casting for, for Star Wars, was the fact that I was working uh, as, a, as a carpenter in Francis Coppola's office, working on the door when George and Richard Dreyfus walked in. Bring me the hydro spanners! For uh, an interview for Star Wars. And I imagine George was a little embarrassed because I was there. Ow! We chatted briefly, and I think that only served to remind him of my being around and available. He wanted uh, a very specific actor to play Han Solo. George and... wanted Christopher Walken, and I think he saw in Christopher Walken, who, who was very eccentric and very kind of evil, but he had this sort of delicious quality about him. But he was, he, he was sort of extraterrestrial. And um, I don't know. We felt very strongly that he should have, he, he the, should use Harrison because who was more we... fun. Star Wars was pretty difficult to read as a script because a lot of the description was of special effects and, uh, and, and it looked like a description of something that was impossible to create on screen. There's a line I remember from the original test where Han Solo says, hey, look, I've held up my side of the bargain and I'm turning this ship around. I said, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquilae or Sullust, and what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. And I thought, who talks like this? Well, I did say to George, you can type this shit, but you can't say it. And, uh, and, and it's, still, it's still true. I mean, it, it, there's a bit of a trick to say it'll take a few minutes for the Navi computer to calculate the coordinates. Yeah, I've heard all of uh, on the crew, I had the art department, John Barry, who was my production designer. We became like partners in making this thing happen. A lot of the rest of the crew really didn't have any idea what was going on. A lot of the English crew, especially Gil Taylor, were very rough. And, you know, we were there on the set when they, they're like making fun of Chewbacca and saying, put some more light on the dog. <laughs> George doesn't really communicate that directly with people on the set. He, he prefers to have everything on film or on some kind of digital format that he can weave you around into whatever formation he wants. I have never seen him so depressed into the question, you really say, is he going to make it through this movie? Is he going to get up in the morning to go to the set? 
because he so much of what George visualized he was not able to achieve and he was in a state of just constant frustration every day it, he 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 said you know I, you know you're not going to get 100 percent but you know you think maybe you'll get 70 or 80 he said I'm getting like 40 percent every day crews wouldn't work after 5 30 and that sort of thing where you just really it really you know if you just get another hour or so you could sort of finish the scene and then move on and you wouldn't drop behind and as a result of that it, we you know we fell several weeks behind schedule and um, the studio finally cut us off and I sort of ended up with a an 80 percent shot movie yeah, right. George I think came from sort of a middle-class background and he felt it was irresponsible to go over budget and he's always felt like that and so he doesn't and he cuts corners although it's killing him and he'll finish on time and he'll find cheaper ways to do things. I came back, ILM had not shot anything at all. They'd spent half of their budget. They had no shots whatsoever. And uh, it just looked like I, the ship had sunk and I just hadn't realized it yet. The effects industry in Hollywood was virtually non-existent in the mid 70s. So to produce the special effects, Lucas had established his own company, ILM, Industrial Light and Magic. Right say around the beginning of 1976, the hardware, the gear started arriving that had been designed for, for the Dijkstra Flux camera and some of the other camera gear, animation equipment that we were going to be using. And it took six or eight months to actually get that stuff actually functioning. It was very difficult to try to make that schedule because no film had really been done like that before, where you had to develop so much hardware at the beginning of it in order to get the vision on the screen. In the days of Star Wars, I don't think George even really thought of special effects as special effects. He just wanted to make his movie. Stay in attack formation. After Star Wars, Lucas moved ILM to San Rafael. From there, it has pioneered changes in technology and dominated the special effects industry, becoming a highly profitable business. You know, I finished the movie and got it cut, and the studio loved it, which was kind of a unique experience for me. And then um, showed it around to a bunch of my friends. The film started, and that crawl, which explains the sort of backstory of the evil empire fighting the, the forces of the rebellion, was about three times longer, and it looked like it had been shot on somebody's driveway and the camera was on a wheelbarrow or something because it was all jiggly and it went on forever. And it was so confusing. There were no special effects. It had been all cut with World War II footage to simulate the battles. When they're shooting at the Imperial starships, they're, they're shooting at Messerschmitts and, and Japanese Zeros. Brian De Palma started saying, George, it looks like she's got two Stainishes stuck on both sides of her head. What kind of hairstyle is that? And he said, what is this about the force of others? I mean, what, what is you that? You call that a shot when you introduce <laughs> Darth Vader? I mean, that's your villain, and that's the best you could do. <laughs> so if there was one person who was much more enthusiastic than anybody else, and that was Steve Spielberg, who kept saying, I think it's going to make $100 million. And we kept Steve. No, wait! You forget it! I already tried it! It's magnetically sealed! Put that thing away! You're gonna get us all killed! Absolutely, your worship. Look, I had everything under control until you let us down here. You know, it's not gonna take them long to figure out what happened to us. It could be worse. It's worse. I was the most extreme of the sort of arty filmmakers. And everybody else was in the middle. And here I, as I moved completely over to the other side where I'm doing kind of kids' movies. And it, and it just blew everybody's mind. They just couldn't figure out what I was doing. Hey! I knew you'd come back. I just knew it. Well, I was going to let you get all the credit and take all the rewards. Hey, Andy, that was more to you than money. Star Wars seems like a, a very kind of traditional, a fantasy, young person's film. Um, it actually functions more like a silent film. I'm not interested in 
you know, just telling a story or recording a play or recording a book or something. I'm more interested in creating a piece of film that can only be experienced as a piece of film when it's finished. Star Wars became a phenomenon, breaking all box office records and winning critical acclaim with six Academy Awards. However, the pressures of making Star Wars had taken such a heavy toll on Lucas that he gave up directing. George, at least in those days, got very inward and very tight and very worried and nervous, and, and he didn't like, you know, dealing with actors who, who if you say, let do this for me, they might say, why? <laughs> you know, and the, George doesn't, you know, why is not what he wants to get into. The great success of Star Wars didn't lead to the independence and the personal filmmaking. George never made another film after that. Instead, he became, you know, a, a producer and uh, an entrepreneur. But his enthusiasm for his trilogy remained. Sick of studio interference and pressure, he decided to finance the second part with his own money, investing the profits of Star Wars and its reputation in the hands of his former USC tutor, Irvin Kirshner. The thing that scared me as much as, as the actual technical aspect of the film was the fact that George uh, said, you know, I, it's my money that's paying for this film. When I read Empire, I said, wow, this is a pretty melancholy, downbeat successor to the first film, which was all jolly and happy and tied up in a neat package, and uh, off we went triumphantly to get our, our medals. But um, this one, I thought, was deeper, darker, and, of course, at the end, we had all been defeated quite soundly. What happened to your father? He told me enough. Lucas's faith was rewarded when Empire took almost as much money as Star Wars. I am your father. With Empire made, Lucas had only the final part of his trilogy to complete. Return of the Jedi was released in 1983 and again broke box office records. Until its re-release, the trilogy had earned $1.3 billion. Yeah. But this figure was dwarfed by the $3 billion from merchandising, a right which Fox had given away to Lucas during contractual negotiations on the first Star Wars, believing it to be worthless. It is very strange being merchandised as a character in, in every format and art form, and from bubblegum to, you know, bar of soap to a breakfast cereal. You know, Star Wars pretty much created merchandising in the movies. Did I enjoy being a bubblegum card? Yes. I thought you had to be like a, a good athlete to become a bubblegum card. And um, we created a new way to be a bubblegum card. Kellogg's C-3PO's. Twin rings of honey-sweetened oats, corn and wheat fused together in outer space for a truly galactic breakfast. Yes, the Force can be with you at breakfast with Kellogg's C-3PO's. But Star Wars marketing didn't end in the shops. In 1985, the Star Tours ride was opened by Lucas at Disneyland. My character is out there on the outside, sort of mending the spaceship that you might get it into, bantering with R2. And then my voice track is going along there. I also do the seat announcements, you know. Please make sure your seat belts are securely fastened. What is it now, Artu? Disney have recently opened a new ride based on another enduring Lucas creation. Well, Indiana Jones, actually, I came up with the idea while I was pondering over Star Wars. George had always wanted to do a serial. Then I started playing around with this other idea of an archaeologist who was a treasure hunter and, um, and a real high action concept thing, which I was playing with with Star Wars, but I said, well, I can even do a purer form of that. Yeah, he said it would have certain affinities to James Bond. That was... Well, the James Bond, what he liked about James Bond was this, that the movie always opened with the end of the last episode. <laughs> Thank you. 
So James Bond was always in some action sequence that really didn't have anything to do with the rest of the film, and then he'd be given his new mission and go off and do it. I started taking it to my friends. I took it to Phil Kaufman, and he worked on it for a little while. He actually came up with the idea for the arc, and then he didn't want to do it. He went off and did another movie, and then I'd tell people, and they'd say, oh, that's interesting. And so after I finished Star Wars, I um, told it to Steven, and he just jumped on the idea and said, this is great. When, uh, when first I was aware of Indiana Jones, it had already been cast. And Tom Selleck uh, was uh, to be Indiana Jones. It was only the fact that Tom uh, couldn't get out of his contract uh, for a television series that led to George, once again, uh, casting about. <laughs> For Indiana Jones, Lucas decided to go back to the studios. With a Spielberg Lucas dream ticket, he was able to secure the most profitable deal in Hollywood history. Rich from the profits of Raiders, Lucas began work on developing his own production facility based on the Zoetrope dream. This was the land that he worked by. It was the dream of an upright man. There was a room that was filled with love. It was a love that I was proud of. As a writer, and when I was doing key checks, I worked in my house. You know, I wrote the script in my house. When I edited the film, I put my editing machine in the attic. I put Walter Murch down in my second bedroom, and I turned my house into a studio. Um, I just wanted to continue that idea. When we first drove out there, and it was nothing but, you know, countryside, except suspiciously, it was on Lucas Valley Road. And I said, was this the only piece of land you looked at? I think what he was trying to do was recreate film school. I wanted it to be uh, a very warm and kind of nurturing environment. At worst, it's sort of like Xanadu, where he's built this thing up there that I don't know what they're going to do with it when George is gone. While Lucas built Skywalker, he began to sponsor his friend's more artistic projects, and the Indiana Jones series rumbled on. However, newer films such as Howard the Duck and Tucker were critical and commercial failures, a downturn accompanied by the breakdown of his marriage. I think that George is interested in making very specific things, and uh, it, it's not really clouding his judgment. Like you would say, well, maybe it's foolish for George to have wanted to make Howard the Duck, but there was something very appealing about that idea to George. Welcome to my kingdom. 1988's Willow, directed by American graffiti star Ron Howard, was a clear reworking of the mythic basis of Star Wars. Yet symptomatically, it was mocked by critics and drew only a modest profit. Laura Dannon knows you have the courage to help us. There are definitely some parallels between some of the characters and some of the situations between Willow and Star Wars, and I, I was probably always working against that. But in George's mind, that wasn't a problem because the Star Wars characters weren't really original either. They were more an acknowledgement um, than a new invention. And, and all he had done is sort of put them into this sci-fi world. And what we were doing was, you know, creating this, this world of magic and swords and sorcery. You can only expect maybe 10% of the movies to be successful. You know, this isn't an art form that's that easy to pull off. And most of the films creatively fail. But in the end, all I do is make the movies I want to make. Most of them are pretty far out there. And most of them aren't very successful. But people forget the unsuccessful ones. And then nobody comes and does interviews about uh, Mishima or Kegamusha or Pawakwatsi. He made a choice once he realized that he had a talent for appealing to this massive audience of young people. Uh, his choice was not to go on with uh, you know, his, in, his personal work. Lucas and Coppola collaborated again in 1986 on Tucker, the Man and His Dream, the story of an automobile entrepreneur. It was also unsuccessful. You make certain creative choices, you know, if we, uh, like Willow we made a little darker than one would 
uh, than the audience would accept. I've dealt with subject matters, you know, with things like Tucker that people just weren't interested in. Some of them, you know, in terms of connecting with an audience, don't work. Uh, but I'm always pleased with the movies I've made. I mean, I've never made a movie that I'm not happy with. He called me one day and he said, have you seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, you should really see it. Because you know what? He said, 50 years from now, if you show Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and you show Howard the Duck, they're going to say, Howard the Duck is so much better made. It's such a better movie. And if you say which one was the hit, they won't be able to tell you. Oh, that's good. George was one of the most talented American film directors of that time and um, somehow with the great success of Star Wars we were deprived of those films that he was going to make and might have made and instead we have a you know an enormous you know kind of industrial marketing complex right here Java I've been waiting for you Gone like we be. <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna run, did you? I'm a boogie. I mean, ultimately, you know, my life has taken a very funny twist from where I expected it to go, and I'm not sure why, other than I did what I wanted to do, and I was making the kind of movie that I wanted to make. George can do anything he wants. When you're in that position, it's hard to say what you know, what your eye is really on, and what, or what you're, what you're afraid of, you know, what you're afraid that maybe uh, the unknown, it's, it's always easier to go into something you know than to something that's unknown, such as a new film that's not based on Star Wars. This September, shooting begins on part one of a new Star Wars trilogy. It will be the first film to be directed by Lucas for 20 years. We don't have to have me anyway, we could have her rehearsing. Yeah. Uh, which would... But there's always been this lure of going back and finishing the story because the story in, as a whole, all you know, 12 hours of it, is actually more interesting than what's out there now. The prequels will be a much darker and much more complex set of films. They, they uh, hinge around the story of Anakin Skywalker, who is Darth Vader. And we meet Anakin when he's a young boy and we watch him become a Jedi Knight, and we, be, we watch him meet Obi-Wan, who becomes his mentor. But much more importantly, all of those films lead up to the moment, that crisis moment in his life where he chooses the dark side. Yeah. You actually get the whole story, and you're able to see them in context and then understand where, what Vader's side of the story is, which you haven't heard yet. I don't think we're involved in that either. I mean, ultimately, with Star Wars, the big chance I'm taking is I'm working on something that I started 20 years ago. And whether it'll fit into the modern world, marketing-wise, I'm not sure. Fortunately, I'm in a situation where I don't really have to worry too much about that. I can just make the movie the way I see fit, and wherever the chips fall are going to be pretty much OK. So he's accepted the fact that he's Mr. Star Wars, and that's when he just got behind the whole thing and said, let's go. Let's just do it right. If you write my character's name out and just use the first initial, it's Luke S. No one could ever guess that a guy like that could come in and bring all of Hollywood to its knees. Hollywood as the Death Star and George as the conquering hero. I hope that George Lucas, the filmmaker, finally emerges and uh, goes his own way uh, against perhaps the wishes of George the entrepreneur. I think once we finish these prequels, he will start to do the more interesting experimental films that he's always wanted to do. No matter how many billions of dollars Star Wars could earn, and no matter how valuable that franchise that they call is, it isn't worth a tenth of what he's worth as an artist and what he's capable of doing.
And here at Stage B at Leaveston is where it all begins.